like one of those people with the flashing light above. Applause now, applause now. Yes. Well, welcome everybody. It's wonderful to be here again. And um, if you've already been to this talk before, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm always, always, always delighted to be here and to talk about the stained glass and the mosaics because this is such a special place. And I really, really applaud the work that the parish is doing in trying to preserve this very, very special building. Um, I'm going to talk today about three things. One is the actual built form of the church itself. The second is the mosaics. And the third is the stained glass windows. So when I talk about the actual built form of the church, you're, you're in here. You're sitting in the nave of the church. Everything okay? Keith yep, we're yep. Good. Sitting in the nave of the church. Behind me is the chancel, behind the chancel arch, and we have two transepts as well, and the tower. So, what I want you to do before we do anything else is simply just close your eyes. Close your eyes, everybody, and imagine a different church because this is what the church would have looked like up to 1860s when it, when it was renovated. So in 1811, it was built, and it was essentially a box. The tower was built, but the rest of it stopped at the chancel arch. So this was the back wall of the church. There were no transepts. There was just this rectangular box and the pews. And the whole focus, you can open your eyes now and see the difference between then and now. So between that and inside this rectangular box, was no ornamentation whatsoever. There were no stained glass windows, there was no painting, no pictures, no mosaics, just plain walls. And the beautiful hammer beam ceiling. Hammer beam ceiling. Um, so the the this was a very, very, very typical of Church of Ireland churches in uh, at the beginning of the nineteenth century. Um, very, they were very plain. They were often called preaching boxes. And the emphasis was on coming to listen to a sermon based on the Bible delivered from the pulpit. So the whole emphasis was on the word. And the word was delivered from the pulpit. And you had no distractions. And that was really important. There was nothing to look at. You could focus and concentrate on the sermon. And about beginning in about the 18, as early as the 20s, but by the 1840s, there was a whole new approach to church architecture and church liturgy, first in the Church of England, and then, of course, by extension, in the Church of Ireland. And it's what was called the Oxford Movement, sometimes called the Tractarian Movement. Um, and it was led by people like John Henry Newman, and by the architect Pugin. And the whole different, it was really, really a whole different approach. Uh, you were supposed to go back to what the, the, the great churches were looking like and sounding like in the Middle Ages the, uh, before the Reformation. And uh, so the whole ideal of architecture became um, neo Gothic. Uh, just like this little church is, neo-Gothic with tall pointed windows with tracery at the top and um, as, as high as possible to lead the eye upwards to heaven and towards God. You were supposed to have lots of ornamentation inside the church, stained glass windows, paintings, um, frescoes, just as highly ornamented as possible because it was tr through great art that you would glorify God. And this was a very, this was su such a difference, like Atlantic and Pacific, the approach to being in a sacred space. And you were supposed to put in stained glass windows. Um, and this was uh, very diff difficult because there had been no stained glass in Britain and Ireland, or very, very little since the medieval period. So there's a little bit of medieval stained glass left in England. Anyone who's ever been to, for example, York Minster will have seen some, but there was none in Ireland. There wasn't any stained glass left. So what happened? What happened to all the stained glass? 
Well, at the dissolution of the monasteries in the uh, 16th century, a lot of the monasteries, a lot of the abbeys and churches at this point were destroyed, or they were taken over for use as secular, uh, for secular use, sometimes as dwellings. Um, and so a lot of destruction happened then. But what really, what really um, caused most of the destruction was the advent of the Puritans. So Cromwell, as we know, came and destroyed a lot of our churches, but it was the Puritans who really um, focused on a very, very plain, low church form of worship. And anything, anything that even smacked remotely of what they considered to be idolatry was verboten. And idolatry was any kind of representation of saints or God or Jesus or Mary or anything like that. So that's why over the centuries, churches got plainer and plainer and plainer. And in fact, all of the medieval stained glass was smashed. Statues were taken out and smashed or they were defaced. Um, uh, frescoes were painted over. And what you got then by the beginning of the 19th century were these plain, unornamented preaching boxes. And then the Tractarians came along and said, no, 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 no. We have to go back to a much more Catholic form of worship. And this created shockwaves in the church. So before I get on to talking about stained glass, which was one of the ways in which the shockwaves were sort of manifested, let's talk a little bit about these wonderful mosaics. How many people here is it your first time in the church? Great, 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 because I always remember the first time I came in and how my jaw dropped when I saw this amazing space. Um, mosaics were very popular uh, in, the, in the Victorian period. They were very, and so was tile, these wonderful encaustic tiles that you see here on the floor. So mosaic and tile, and the mosaics and tiles in this church were both made by Minton. And we think of Minton as uh, the provider of fine bone china, but in fact, they were the biggest manufacturer of tiles and mosaic tiles uh, in, in Britain and Ireland at the time. Uh, so the artisans, I understand that the artisans to actually erect the mosaics were brought in from Italy. And this was a very expensive process. Buying the mosaic tiles, having them all planned, having them laid out was very expensive. And a lot of the mosaic is in memory of the Travers family, the local family, who would have paid to have the, the mosaics done. And as the mosaics, uh, as, as the parish and the parishioners ran out of money, uh, the mosaics, okay here, the, mo the mosaics uh, sort of ground to a halt, as it were, and there was still quite a bit left to do. Um, now, uh, the final donation of funding for the mosaics came from an Indian Maharaja. And I, th I bet this is the only church in Ireland in which an Indian Maharaja paid to finish off the decoration of the church. And so here we have the dedication here. For many years, medical officer of the Gwalior State, Central India, and the faithful and devoted friend of Major General the Maharaja, Sir Padmo Rao Sindhya of Gwalior, who has erected this monument. So the Maharaja of Gwalior erected the monument, erected, finished uh, paying for the uh, mosaics. And here he is with Martin Crofts. So Martin Crofts was um, a medical officer in the British Army. You can come up and see this later. Uh, he was a medical officer in the British Army. And he had been appointed kind of like the guardian and the tutor of the Maharaja, who was only nine years old when he succeeded to his father's title. And they became lifelong friends. They both loved to go tiger hunting on the backs of elephants. And there are wonderful paintings that showed the Maharaja of Gwalior riding out on a tiger hunt on the back of an elephant. Um, but they became lifelong friends. And when Martin Crofts retired, he came here to Timberleague 
to retire and he only lasted i think about a year after he retired he died in 1915 and that was when the uh, maharaja provided the money to finish off the wonderful mosaics and you have this great memorial statement uh, to show that he did it in memory of his lifelong friend so the mosaics are very unusual to see this level of mosaics in a church floor to ceiling really well not quite floor but you know halfway up to ceiling the ones in the chancel uh, this, the angels, the wonderful angels in the chancel are actually painted but they're painted in such a way that they almost sort of match and mirror the mosaics, they almost look like mosaics themselves and there are quite a few um, areas within the chancel that have gold leaf um, mosaics on them as well the uh, iconography the, the images or, or motifs uh, all are a mixture of Christian Jewish and Islamic. So the Islamic, if you look at the window back there and you see in the surround of the window, you see the sickle. Those, um, that's a traditionally an Islamic motif. And then you have a lot of floral motifs, which can be anything, of course, and some Christian symbolism as well. Uh, of course, the, the um, uh, the ascension, all done in mosaics on the east wall, is, uh, what can I say about it? It's not a great work of art, but uh, it's very impressive that the whole thing is done in mosaic. You can imagine the difficulty of that, designing it and then executing it. So it's very, very impressive. Um, and then you have various Christian symbols, so I'll direct your attention to two of those on either side of the chancel arch. So on the left-hand side, you have the traditional Christian symbol of the lamb. And then on the right-hand side, you have the pelican. And the, the symbol of the pelican is of a pelican piercing her own breast to produce drops of blood to provide food for her young and that is taken to be a reference to Jesus sacrificing his life for his church, shedding his blood for his church. So that is in fact a very Christian symbol. So let's move on now to the stained glass and what's really special about this church is that it, this one small building encapsulates the whole history of Victorian stained glass in a way that very few buildings in Ireland have ever done. So when, um, when the um, movement started again to put stained glass in churches, it was very difficult because nobody had been making stained glass. Throughout the 18th century, there was colored glass, but it was, uh, it was done with enamels and baked, in to, uh, baked on enamels. Uh, so the actual process of taking colored pieces of glass, cutting them to shape, producing them in the first place, cutting them to shape, leading them between lead canes and assembling them, that all had to be reinvented. And it was reinvented by a whole uh, series of people who went out and, and studied medieval stained glass wherever they could find it, sometimes on the continent, sometimes in places like, like uh, York Minster. And the, the man who became known as the father of Victorian glass was a man called Thomas Willamant. And he was one of the, um, one of the, one of the uh, people who did that, who went out and studied and, and reinvented. And there are three Willamant stained glass windows in this church, or windows, I should say, in this church, dating from when the church was built in 1811. And the two windows were originally here in what was the back wall of the church. And those two windows are the ones that are now in the west wall there and there. So take a look at those. Those two windows uh, are Thomas Willamant windows. Um, and they are plain glass or clear glass quarries. That's the name that's given to those kind of diamond-shaped panes, surrounded by very colorful floral motif. 
So it's not figurative. It's not representational. There's no saints. There's no angels. There's nothing like that. But it's still stained glass. It still adds a really lovely decorative touch to those windows. And that's about as far as that's about as far as stained glass could go in this area of the plain, unornamented preaching box. And this, it was, um, it was, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so, so it was still stained glass, and, and he had reinvented this technique of putting together colored glass. Um, and, um, and that's sort of uh, very significant because the only other church in Ireland which has Thomas Willamant stained glass is in Sligo. So this is one of the only two places in Ireland that has Willamant stained glass. Very, very significant. So the beginning of the reinvention of stained glass, but no representation. So then, in the height of this new Oxford movement, Tractarian movement, reordering the churches, one of the directives to all churches was that they had to, it's, it's sort of like how um, the Catholic Church, in the wake of the Ecumenical Council, had to reorder to, so their altars could face the people and all of that kind of thing. So this was a similar sort of movement throughout all the churches. And this, one of the directives was that you had to add on a chancel. And that's when this back wall, the big hole was pushed into the back wall. Those windows that were there were moved to here. And this whole new chancel was added on. That was in the early 1860s. And once they had added on this chancel, there was a chance to put in a stained glass window. And whoever was in charge of the church at the time, the rector, ordered a window from the foremost manufacturer of stained glass. And this was still very much in its infancy at this point. And one of the really big names was William Warrington. And William Warrington made this stained glass window. And you can see his signature in the bottom left-hand corner, along with the date of 1865. So we know exactly who did it and when it was put in. Now, this is a very, very unusual window for a Protestant church anyway. So Protestant churches are very few ha would have um, an image of a crucifixion as prominently displayed as this is. It's just not one of the pieces of iconography that is usual in a Protestant church. Um, very often in an east window like this, you'll see the four evangelists, or you might see images from Bible stories, like um, the Good Samaritan, for example, or you might see the four virtues, you know, hope and charity and humility and things like that. But to have a sort of a, a, a large, colorful image of the middle one being, the middle light being two crucifixion, the uh, left-hand light being Peter raising Dorcas, and the right one being the presentation in the temple. The middle one and the right one, the presentation, are very Catholic. They're very from the kind of set of images that we would find in a Catholic church. The left one, the Peter raising Dorcas, not quite so much. So it was all part of the kind of embracing of this new kind of Anglo-Catholicism. Uh, but the bishop of Cloyne, when he arrived to dedicate the new chancel, took one horrified look at this window and said, that's too much for me. That is Romish. And he demanded that a huge black curtain be draped over the window, and he wouldn't dedicate the chancel until that happened. And that, chur that big black curtain stayed up for a while, stayed up for quite a while. And then eventually, I guess the rector thought, well, you know, maybe people are used to it now, and it kind of makes the whole place dark, and let's see if we can take it down. So he took down the curtain, and there was a riot. People marched on the church, somebody put a brick through the window, up went the curtain again. 
And it was quite a while. I don't know how long, but it was quite a while, maybe a few years before he slowly thought, well, maybe I can take down, maybe I can take down now. And finally, the curtain came down, and nobody made a peep, and it was all okay. It could stay. Now, William Warrington, it's wonderful to have a Warrington window. There are, indeed, very few Warrington windows in Ireland. Um, I made a count, and there are only 19 in total of the 3,200 windows listed on the site nina.ie, which is a list of all the windows in Protestant churches in Ireland, the whole island, is only 19 by William Warrington. So once again, very, very special. Okay, so then the curtain came down, then everybody relaxed, and then it, over time it just became normal to have this stained glass window and a figurative stained glass window at that. And so then we thought, woohoo, well, let's go for more. And one by one, the empty, the openings got filled with stained glass. So all of the stained glass was ordered from catalogues, which was the way it was done. Catalogues, uh, the traveling salesman would come round with their catalogues, and you'd say, I'll have one of those and one of those. And if you wanted something other than what was in the catalog, you paid more if you wanted something designed specially for you. So what you're seeing in these stained glass windows is more or less images that, you, that are very common. And I think that whole idea of ordering from the catalog, which over time then became the way that the Catholic churches also got filled up with stained glass, it sort of is one of the reasons why we don't really see stained glass anymore. It becomes like wallpaper. We grow up with it. We all, you know, grew up going to church. There was always stained glass. You know, maybe you looked at it a bit, but mostly you just took it for granted. And after a while, your eyes, your eyes just glazed over and you didn't even notice it anymore. Which is why it's wonderful that it's sort of almost being rediscovered now. So the next lot of stained glass windows went in in 1883, which was almost 20 years after this one. And the three windows were by a firm called Lavers, Barode, and Westlake. And the artist was Nathaniel Westlake, who was very influenced by the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. So those three windows are this one, and this is the Sermon on the Mount. And then this one, which is Christ walking on the water. And finally, this one at the back, which is the miraculous, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. Now, Westlake, as I said, was, was very influenced by the pre raphaelites And you can see that influence, I think, in his art. But the other thing I want you to notice about this the east window and every other window that we look at is that the story part of the window, the, um, the representational part of the window occupies only about half the window. And the rest of the window is taken up with an elaborately painted canopy above and then a decorative predella, which is the name for the lowest part of the window. And this idea of always setting the scenes or the saints or the figures within a canopy comes from the convention in Gothic cathedrals of having the carvings on the outside always sitting on a plinth and covered with a canopy. And you see that same thing in medieval stained glass. It came, the whole idea of this canopy came from medieval stained glass, and it took a long time, it took well into the 20th century before stained glass windows started being produced that weren't a part of this convention of being within this canopy. Now also, it was a very important cost-saving measure because the canopy and the decorative predella could be painted by an apprentice. It was kind of like cut, cut and paste, cookie cutter, it laid down laid down uh, tracing and traced through it and it could be done by anybody as they were learning to do it, mass producing these. And as you can see, the three um, predellas are very, very similar, if not identical. 
So an apprentice would be an apprentice would be set to do that, and the same with the canopies. They're not, but uh, the three canopies are, I think, pretty well identical as well. And at the very top, in the, the top um, triangle or lozenge there at the top, you see the letters IHS, which is a, called a Christogram. It's just um, a, a symbol of the name of Jesus, and that, you see that on the gravestones um, outside as well. So the, the uh, uh, it wasn't until we get Harry Clark and the arts and crafts movement starting in the 20th century that you, you, people think, well, wait, hold it. Why are we still doing these canopies? So the next window here is this one. The story in this window is the um, centurion servant, the healing of the centurion servant. Um, so the centurion, the Roman centurion, comes and he tells Jesus that his servant is ill and please could he perform a miracle and heal him and uh, the, Jesus says go thy way thou hast believed so be it done unto thee and the, the um, meaning of this story is to do with faith that he, he says just, just go home and believe so you've believed that a miracle can happen, and therefore it can happen. This is, this is by Meyer of Munich. And Meyer of Munich was the single largest producer of stained glass, and is still producing stained glass. It has moved with the times. It's doing wonderful modern glass now. Um, but it, it had, and the reason, one of the reasons it was the single biggest provider of stained glass is that it got a royal imprimatur from the Pope, or royal from the Pope, no I mean a, a special, a special um, uh, imprimatur from the Pope and so it, it became almost like the official Vatican, you know, provider of stained glass. They set up in London as well. So this um, was ordered from Meyer of Munich, it came from Munich and uh, sometimes you see Meyer of London as well. Uh, Meyer uh, is one of those that, you know, most of the windows that you'll see are from a catalogue and they're very samey, samey. Um, but they could, they could really produce wonderful windows if you paid them to do it. So you, get, you got what you pay for. Now the final set of windows are in the transept over there and I think what I'd like to ask you to do is come down there so we can actually look at them and talk about them down there. So if you try and squeeze in and carefully ask Reverend Kingsley. much as you can because uh, you can go up in the pulpit there if you, <laughs> if you want to like uh, yeah come, come in here and, and yeah just so that there's more room for everybody because there's windows here as well so come in come in come in don't be shy All right, so the final, and we we're sort of going in chronological order here. So the Westlake and Barode windows, the three, they were done in 1883. The Meyer of Munich was 1888. These ones were done in 1890 and, 19, uh, 1890 and then 1901. So we talk about the 1891 first. So this is a, pair, a pairing that you often see. So Christ, um, the Good Shepherd, and then Christ as the light of the world. Um, very common. This was this is the work of um, Clayton and Bell, uh, another one of the British firms that were providing a lot of stained glass, and it, it's really beautifully done. I love these small figures here. And still, they're still using the canopies, but instead of a decorative base, a purely sort of abstract decorative base, you have these two other figures, um, which are beautifully done, and and uh, so that's an advance. Um, and then uh, the light of the world uh, was based on a painting by Holman Hunt, who was one of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. He had done 
this painting, and it was it was like you know what we now call a viral sensation. He, um, it was a beautiful painting, but it was because it really appealed to devout Victorians, um, because the whole image is of Christ knocking at the door, asking to be let in. And, and so the, the, it's not an obscure reference at all to opening up your heart and asking, you know, inviting in the Lord. Um, and it, the painting itself uh, went viral. It toured the world. There are accounts of people lining up to see it and ladies fainting when they finally stood in its presence and that kind of thing. It toured the world. It was on tour for years, went to Australia and America. And in the end, I think he did five versions of it, or five copies of it. But, but it became really a favorite. It was engraved, it was in every Victorian house in the living room, and it really became a favorite of stained glass uh, manufacturers. Every single one of them had a version of Light of the World. And there's a really nice one in Ross Carberry Cathedral by uh, Watson of Yall. Um, and another one, I think, in St. Brendan's in Bantry as well. We don't know who the artist from Clayton the Bell was who drew these two, but we do know who the artist was who did these two. And this, that was a man called George Daniels, who was uh, their principal artist. And in fact, he was, he was a freelancer. And you got that. You got freelance uh, stained glass designers uh, working in Victorian Britain. Uh, for example, um, uh, Burne Jones. Uh, was a freelance. He not only was he a pre-Raphaelite painter, but he also designed stained glass windows. And there's a lovely pair by him in Lismore Cathedral. So this is Christ Condemned, and this is Christ the King. And George Daniels had, you sort of instantly almost recognize his style. His faces are really expressive. His hands and his feet are beautifully done. The, he has chosen this wonderful blue uh, glass, dark blue glass for the, uh, uh, the robe, fringed with a, a wonderful golden fringe, and then with these almost, I don't know what you'd call those carbuncles all over the, the robe. Very, um, very cleverly designed, very beautifully done, and very intricate with these little roundels let, let into the robe um, as well. The, the, he's holding an orb, which is also uh, very beautifully done, surmounted by a cross. And then the uh, suffering and the agony uh, in this one with Christ uh, holding a bulrush, which is another, another Christian symbol. Um, you know, it's just beautiful. And Daniel's had a thing for red hair. I, I kind of have a bit of a thing for red hair myself, so maybe that's why... <laughs> Maybe that's why I really, really like these. So I have to say that because my husband is right here. So, so the, um, the great thing about this too is that you can get right up close and you can actually see the techniques of painting. Now you can see why this is really, really important. Look at the crack at the top of the window. And, and this window, of course, will have to be taken out while that is repaired, and that's a really good opportunity to give it a really good clean and, and, and conserve, conserve the window as well. Um, but it's a nice one to finish on because in this area you can really see the damage that in water ingress has made and how important it is. And especially in this little church which contains the whole history of Victorian stained glass right here. Now by the end of the 19th century, um, there was no more stained glass going into this church. There was in other Church of Ireland, but most of the uh, most of the stained glass was now starting to be made in Ireland, and it was going into Catholic churches. And some of the in the Catholic church up the hill, you'll see a really, really it's a, there's some really nice Meyer stained glass in there. But uh, on the west uh, wall above the balcony, you'll see a Harry Clark studio. Very important, notice I'm saying Harry Clark studio, not Harry Clark. So Harry Clark died in 1931. For the last couple of years of his life, he was extremely ill. 
um, and all of the work was done by his artists that he had trained rigorously to reproduce his style. So the two artists responsible for um, the window in Timothy Catholic Church are William Dowling and Richard King, both of whom went on to have really significant stained glass careers themselves. William Dowling continued to run the Harry Clark Studio after Harry died in 1931, and, and um, Richard King was the chief designer there until 1940, and then he left and had a whole career on his own. So also very significant artists. Uh, so um, any, that's more or less everything I have to say, but I'm happy to entertain questions or just hang around if anybody wants to talk more about stained glass.